Michael Rockman, the founder and general director of Sintel Company. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here today. I have a, a few uh, things to talk about in, in terms of uh, leadership in the digital age. And uh, basically, if we're if we're talking about leadership, there's a very uh, kind of it's an important topic these days uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and also, there just the business environment is going through a number of changes. If we look at globalization, like digitalization, uh, the change of, of behavior in the workforce, uh, all kinds of different uh, elements that are affecting business. And leaders have to evolve along with these evolution, evolutionary trends in business uh, as a whole. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen so that we can start uh, the presentation. And we're just going to start with uh, a little bit of uh, talking about the evolution of business models. So if we look at what's happened in the, in the world over the last, say, 50 years, um, there, there's been an evolution of business models going from balance sheet centric business models to product centric business models to customer centric business models and ultimately relationship centric business models. So if we take a, we're not going to go into too much depth uh, in each one of these. And actually this, this whole presentation today, which is, is 35, 40 minutes, uh, is part of a much larger course that we do that goes over the course of three days on how businesses are evolving and actually how the leaders need to evolve along with the business. So this today is just a little sampling uh, of the, of the topics in the, in the larger course. So if we look at these different business models, balance sheet centric uh, business models are distant from the customer. They're very much centered on, let's say, production environments, things like that. A product centric organization is focused on how do I maximize my, my productivity and how do I spread my product out, my offering out to the largest possible audience. A customer centric organization is going to be wanting to understand what is it that my customer is trying to do? What is my customer trying to achieve? And how do I use the instruments that I have in my business to help my customer achieve their goal, their desired outcome? A relationship centric business, on the other hand, is actually thinking about the, the relationship uh, with that customer, not just an individual need, but even cyclical needs that pop up. So there's an example that I always give uh, from the from the banking industry. I always say, OK, a product centric bank, if you say I need a car, they're going to offer you an auto loan. A customer centric bank, if you say I need a car, they say, well, look, we've got partnerships and all kinds of different things. Let's give you a solution that includes the auto loan and the insurance and a discount from a dealer and roadside assistance and all kinds of things because we can orchestrate that whole thing for you. Um, a relationship centric organization is going to look at me and say, hey, you just bought a car. You're probably going to want another car in three to five years. So let's get you started on that, because the more efficiently we manage the cyclical nature of purchases, uh, the more we can create value for you as our customer. So these are very interesting uh, stages in the evolution of, of business models, but also in the evolution of thinking of the leader. So the leaders, I said, in a product centric business is thinking about how I get my offering out to the largest group of people. Not very important if they need it or not. <laughs> how do I get my product out there? Customer centric, the, the form of thinking is so different because it's about what is my customer trying to achieve and how do I help my customer to achieve that goal? Uh, the relationship centric is again, the nature of relationships. And these can be relationships with customers, but also relationships with partners, employees, any, any counterparty that the business is going to have relationships with. Now, where we are globally is kind of in this little bubble here, uh, which is stuck between product centric and customer centric business models. And there's a little bit of a problem with this. Um, the problem is in, in the format that we use, let's say data and CRM systems, I mean, the whole idea of customer centric business models was that we would learn from the data and we would have all of this knowledge about our customers and we would be able to offer them the right solutions at the right time for the right price and so on. And that just didn't happen. Um, so what happened is product centric business models implemented CRM functionality uh, and it stretched out the lifespan of a product centric business model versus actually helping to transform the business into a customer centric business model. Now, there's a few examples that I wanted to share with you of, of customer centric and relationship centric offerings. Um, my iPhone, for example, uh, is purchased on an iPhone upgrade program in the United States. So I pay a monthly fee. Uh, everything is included, including Apple Care and, and uh, well, Apple Care Plus uh, Plus. So if I lose it, it gets stolen, I break it, I get a new phone, no questions asked. 
And then the interesting thing is every year they send me a new phone and every year I send the old phone back. So every year I have, I have this fantastic new phone. <laughs> uh, I don't have to think about it and it's just like a subscription. And subscriptions are a very interesting part of relationship-centric offerings. Anything that has a cyclical nature to it, that cyclical nature can be managed or even manipulated. So Apple, the reason they launched this was they realized that the average span for purchase, the average, average cyclicality for purchasing a new iPhone was one phone every two years. Um, with this program, they now sell one phone every year. Uh, they have to figure out what to do with all the millions of old phones, uh, but that was not such a difficult task. So they managed to manipulate that, and that is one. And the iPhone is one of the key drivers of Apple's share price. So a very interesting thing to manipulate that cyclicality of the iPhone purchase. Now a couple of other examples. Um, Cadillac uh, launched a service in New York, and as far as I know, they're rolling it out into other large cities in the U.S. now where they created a, a big kind of uh, carpool of, of uh, Cadillacs in, in New York City. And you could basically buy a, a subscription for access uh, to this, this large pool of vehicles in there. So you pay $1,500 a month, everything is included, the insurance, the servicing, they'll even park it for you if you're gonna be out of town for a while. And you can change cars 18 times per year. <laughs> so if you have friends in town and you wanna ride around in an Escalade for, for a week, uh, and then the next week you're gonna be driving around the city and you want something a little bit more economical and fuel, uh, you've, you've got the opportunity to change cars 18 times per year. I don't know who would do that, but, but the access and the availability of that is alluring. Um, another fun example is Massage Envy. Massage Envy is a, is a chain of, uh, let's say, massage uh, places, salons. Um, and they have, they have actually other services there, like skincare and stretching and, and fitness and things like that. Um, but it's basically you're paying a, a monthly fee for a tariff plan, and that tariff plan has certain things included. And if you don't use it all, it rolls over to the next month, or you can give it to a friend or whatever. So it's interesting. And they have uh, 1,150 of these locations where you can use any of, any of the services in any of the locations for your monthly fee. Uh, and if you're using more, then you get discounts on the additional services and so on. So again, access and a subscription. And this is an interesting one. Nike just launched uh, what they call the Nike Adventure Club. Um, so this is a subscription to shoes for your kids. Um, I kind of wish they would do one for me, uh, but so far it's only for kids. Um, so you're basically signing up for four, six, or 12 pairs of shoes for children's shoes uh, over the course of a year, and there's a monthly fee. Um, and they even have, this is interesting, they even have, uh, if, you, if you don't have, let's say, other children to do the hand-me-downs, uh, you, you can actually give the shoes back and they get recycled or they go to charity programs and so on. So very interesting uh, offering the way they've structured this. And again, they're tying it to a subscription. So these are all really good examples of relationship-centric pricing uh, models, which, which is one of the aspects of relationship centricity. So I want to show you one more, which is kind of funny, um, because it's a subscription to underwear. That's called Underwear Expert. <laughs> and, uh, I'll say right away, they don't take the old pairs back. Um, uh, but really, I found this. One day I was uh, you know, just kind of navigating Instagram, <clears throat> and I came across an ad for this, and I thought, well, I have to at least explore this because it's part of my business in studying business models and helping companies to transform. So I thought, okay, let me take a look at this and see, see where it's going. So you sign up for one, two, or three pairs of underwear every one, two, or three months. Uh, and then they ask you a whole bunch of questions about what your preferences are and do you like shorter or longer? Do you like the, the you know, what type of design would you like? What type of fabric is comfort more important or support and all these different things. And they, you know, after that long list of questions, they, they choose and send me the, the underwear that they've chosen for me. And after I got the first package, I thought really interesting. So after three weeks, I got uh, an email from them saying, can you please answer all these questions and tell us about your experience? Um, so I went through a survey of 12 or, or 13 different questions, very kind of intimate questions uh, because of the nature of the product. Um, and, and in essence, um, they were learning about me from that. <clears throat> and at the end of, of the email, after I answered all the questions, they said, uh, thank you very much. We will try to guess better for you next time. We'll try to choose better for you. And this is one of the elements of, uh, it's another element of relationship-centric offerings, which is a learning relationship. The more they have the opportunity to interact with me, the more they can learn about me 
um, and the more they're able to customize, service me better, better choose for me, and so on. So really interesting, I thought. And then another aspect of a relationship-centric business model is monetizing additional categories of things. And it was after probably four or five packages that I got from them, I got an email saying, you know, oh, no, it was before I got a particular package, I got an email saying, your order is almost ready. Um, you wouldn't happen to need socks, would you? <laughs> so, and sure enough, I needed socks. Uh, so now I have a subscription to underwear and to socks, and I'm wondering what the next thing is that's going to pop up. Maybe it's t-shirts or maybe it's pajamas, who knows? Um, but now I have these kind of subscriptions, and that is really the essence of these relationship-centric offerings. So there's a lot changing in the way that businesses are monetizing and the way that businesses are reacting to customer preferences, needs, and behavior. Um, and this evolution of business models is very important to understand for anybody in a leadership position, because if you're not reacting to the changes in behavior, needs, and preferences of your customers and not evolving your business model as, as those behavior, needs, and preferences are evolving for your customers, you're going to be left behind. Um, so very important for leaders to keep this in, in consideration. Another thing we have to think about is that most management models in business uh, are still, they still have uh, what, what I call the hangover from classical management theory. Um, so three main players in classical management theory from about a hundred years ago, you've got Max Weber, you've got Henri Fayol, and you've got uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor, who were kind of the fathers of this, this classical management theory. And if you look at Frederick Winslow Taylor, he had some very interesting influences on management theory. And a couple of them were this idea that you need to separate the do from the thinkers in an, in an organization and you need to focus all of the doers on doing things the one best way and making sure that everything is engineered for efficiency and so on. Well, that was really interesting a hundred years ago when most of the doers were hands on a production line. But if we look at everything that's happened over the last hundred years, uh, a lot of that may not be relevant today. You know, we've got different industrial revolutions. If we look at the four different industrial revolutions that we can talk about, we've got differences in the nature of, of uh, markets and how markets have evolved over time. Uh, so where, you know, a hundred years ago, we had these kind of spacious uh, markets with little competition or we had local markets with high customization, uh, now we're getting into uh, the globalized uh, marketplace where we've got competitors from all over the planet. And if you've got a digital product, it's even worse. Uh, because you can, you know, your, your customer can be buying from uh, China or from India or from the US or wherever and they get their digital product and all of a sudden the markets are overly saturated. Um, so everything has changed dramatically and the way that value is created it also has also changed. So if we go back to the early 1900s when these management models were designed or when classical management theory was designed, since then, we've had the optimization of tasks, we've had the autom automation of simple tasks, we've had the automation of complex tasks, we've got robotiz robotization and artificial intelligence coming online now everywhere. And so all of these things have dramatically changed the way that businesses need to be managed. And these management models have evolved very little. And most businesses are not designed for what we refer to as complexity. Uh, they may be designed for things that are complicated where the, we may not understand what's happening at every step of the process, but the outcome is fairly predictable. In a complex environment, uh, we, we don't understand what's happening and the outcome is very often unpredictable. So we get into these situations where people are involved and it requires multiple possible reactions from an organization. And remember, now we've automated all the, all the things that we could automate and we've created robots and artificial intelligence and so on. So we very much need now a workforce that is able to think and analyze and react. And that form of intelligence has been starved from the front line for years. So the, the intelligence has been very much held up in the hands of a small group of people at the top of a hierarchy. And now we need people on the front line to be able to think and react and react to different situations and react to uncertainty in a very unique way. 
Um, we also need different forms of intelligence to re reach the front line, like emotional intelligence and social intelligence, things that allow us to have empathy and to understand another person's situation, understanding our customer's situation, and have social intelligence, which actually allows us to have the skills to develop and manage relationships. Uh, those skills often are not spread all the way down to the front line, and people don't have the emotional intelligence and social intelligence on the front line that's needed uh, in, in this new environment. So where we actually start looking at these radically decentralized uh, business models, the management models that we have from the past, from classical management theory, are actually making this very difficult. It's actually making it very difficult for us to decentralize, to push intelligence and decision-making authority down to the front line, but because we have all these classical structures and bureaucracies in place. So if we think about this, this is going to be the, the question of the next decade, which is what is centralized and what is decentralized. And every business is going to have to find this balance. But in principle, things that are going to be closer to customers that require thinking and emotional and social intelligence and the ability to react to uncertainty, those are things that we need to push down to the front line. They need to be decentralized. Other things can remain centralized. And when we think about this from, from a management model standpoint, we've kind of got four management models that fit very well with the evolution of business models. So in a balance sheet centric environment, you've got these hierarchical directive structures uh, where it's really based on control how much we can control people. In a product-centric environment, we move to matrix management and you've got multiple different people that are influencing the work that the worker is doing. Um, that actually is a bureaucracy if we think about it. Yeah? Uh, in a customer-centric environment, you get this kind of entrepreneurial partnership, this kind of this idea that we're co-creating and coaching and things like that, this collaborative leadership model. And in a, a relationship-centric environment, this is where you get the adaptive organization, the agile environment that mentality of, of flexibility and being agile and, and a, almost a laissez-faire uh, management style. But leaders in this environment don't necessarily need to be laissez-faire. Uh, they actually need to be inspirers. They actually need the ability to influence and guide. And, and it's a very different form of leadership than if you're in a hierarchical control environment or a matrix management environment. Those are authoritarians and managers. Uh, they're about controlling the work that's done. The ones on the right side here are more about inspiration and guidance and, and moving people to the right place. So uh, another way that we could look at this is an autocracy, a bureaucracy, a meritocracy, or an adhocracy. And these are really interesting concepts. If we think about the fact that most management models uh, and most leaders that have grown up in those old management models were designed by classical management theory, all of a sudden now we have to start considering new management theories and new organizational principles. So this is a really interesting time to think about that. Another brilliant uh, addition to all of this is how the workforce is changing. So we now have over 50% of the workforce globally that are considered digital natives. These are people that grew up with video games, then the internet, then mobile internet, then social networks, and so on. And these people have a very different view of the world, and they have a very different view of what is positive, engaging, and fulfilling. So these aren't the people that are going to start a job when they're 20 and work in that job until they're 60 and retire. That doesn't happen anymore. So these are people that, as I said, have a very different view of what is positive, engaging, and fulfilling, what is fun. Um, and really right now, the work environment for the majority of this, these new generations is not necessarily designed to keep them engaged in, in, in a positive and fulfilling way. So this is a challenge and it's a challenge again for leaders. Um, so Jane McGonigal wrote a book called Reality is Broken and, and I think it was published in 2011. And she wrote some really interesting things in here. So she wrote gamers uh, use games to escape from everything that is broken in the real world and everything that is not satisfying about real life. Well, now we have not only games, but we've got social networks and the availability of just about any type of information you can think of, uh, knowledge, let's call it, on the internet. Uh, it, it could be good knowledge, it could be bad knowledge, uh, but basically everything, absolutely everything is available to us everywhere. Um, and we have these kind of parallel environments where we can engage uh, in games, in social networks, with other people, in discussions, and so on. Uh, and that is changing a lot. So if we think about this, 
Um, let's take a look at this. So this is what, what, was, what is in her book, which is really quite interesting. Um, 10,000 hours is the average time spent playing video games uh, up to age 21. Uh, for a person that's a digital native. Yeah, uh, 10,000 hours is also the average time spent in school, middle and high school through graduation, depends on the country. Um, but basically what we have here is a parallel learning system, right? We've got the school system, which is supposed to be sharing all conventional knowledge and preparing a person for their work life and their life as an adult. And then we have this gaming system, <laughs> which is teaching people a different value system. And we, we need to understand that. And what she writes about, some really interesting things here. So the, the average age of a gamer when she wrote the book was 30. It's actually 33 today. Um, digital natives are people that, that were born into this, this kind of age of digital video games and so on. Uh, but they now are more than ever people that have, that have grown up with uh, instant connectivity, internet, mobile internet, things like that. Um, 6.3 hours per week, the average amount of time spent on games. It's double that if you're under 18. Uh, and if you add social networks into this, you get double that again. Um, so very interesting where the attention is going for, for these audiences, right? Uh, before this, their attention was spent on communicating directly and maybe learning things and so on. And really, games are nature's learning engine. Uh, so this is really interesting. The area of our brain that engages when we're engaged in games and social networks is also the area of our brain that's responsible for learning and memory. Uh, so quite interesting things here. Now, what Jane writes about, which is quite kind of cool, um, is that the values that people are learning when they're growing up in this gaming system as opposed to the traditional education system are, are quite interesting. Blissful productivity. Uh, they enjoy what they're doing, but they're being productive. Uh, social fabric, they're collaborating with each other and communicating with each other and they have these ties to each other. Urgent optimism, they've, they've got to win the war with their tank, they've got to go save the princess or save the kingdom or whatever, they've got this urgent optima, optimism, but they're optimistic about it because they, they can do it and if they fail, they're likely to get another life and the game's not over anyway, right? Uh, and then the epic meaning of all of this, really, they're, they're doing great, fantastic, epic things inside of these games. And if we compare that with the work environment, um, we're clearly not living up to these expectations. So in games, we've got structured experiences, we're trusted with epic missions and inspiring stories, collaborators are ready to work together on common goals, constant positive feedback and rewards for achievement, and we're encouraged to take chances and try new things in these games, right? Because we get another chance if we die. Uh, the work environment is not living up to this at all. Uh, work is often unstructured. We're, we're often not trusted unless we've proven ourselves time and time again. Uh, work environments can be hostile and competitive, and you might have office politics <clears throat> and all these different things involved. Feedback cycle, cycles are often lagging and rewards are slow. Uh, and then you get encouraged to follow rules and not think outside of the box. Like, look, your box is here. You just stay in your box because if you leave your box, then you cause problems for other people in other boxes. And so really, the work environment is not designed for this new generation. And that's where these new business models and the new management models are very important. The new workforce is not designed for classic management theory. They've grown up in a different way and they actually re respond quite differently. If you look at surveys about millennials, uh, they don't wanna have a boss. They wanna have a, a mentor, a guide, somebody that's teaching them and, and pushing them to try new things, right? They don't want a boss. They don't want somebody telling them what to do, some authoritarian and so on. So this is a problem for leaders because we have to actually think about how we're going to evolve. I'm 51 years old. I grew up in classic management theory. I, all of the businesses that I was in, luckily, were on the progressive side. Uh, but sometimes we work with clients where we go, wow, ooh, I would not want to work here. <laughs> and that's kind of a, it's kind of, if we think about that, mentality, that's what all of this new, the digital natives are thinking about, right? I don't want to work here. And all of the things that were classic in, in cultural development, in designing corporate cultures and so on, this idea that we could take uh, people from different backgrounds and bring them into some framework of this is the acceptable behavior in our organization and these are the standards and rules that we have and we've got a control system where we're going to monitor behavior and if people are behaving the wrong way, we'll give them feedback and coach them so that they behave the right way and then we're going to end up with some group of people that are just happy, happy campers, like in the army, all fall in line and so on. And that just doesn't work anymore. It just doesn't work. So with the new generations, with digital natives, millennials, and, and so on, with 
the need for new management models and this desire to transition to agile and adaptive organizations, what we need are three things. We need, first of all, the free flow of information in the organization. If we think about old management models, hierarchical control and matrix management, they were not designed for the free flow of information. My knowledge is my power, not yours. Right. So the free flow of information is is dramatically important for an agile organization or for a collaborative partnership, an entrepreneurial partnership type environment. Um, the other thing that we need for that is communication, open communication in the organization. This idea from classic management theory that you need to go up the hierarchy across and down the other side of the hierarchy to communicate with someone instead of just communicating directly doesn't work anymore. It's, it's strangling the organization from this free flow of information and communication. The second thing that we need is collaboration, the social fabric that we had in games. Uh, all of a sudden, we need that social fabric and, and the epic meaning uh, that we're all working on something really great and the urgent optimism that we're going to launch it quickly and ahead of our competition and so on. We need that in the organizations today. And classic management theory strangles that as well. And the third thing that we need is community. Uh, community will cre create ties across teams. So these can be any type of community. It can be professional communities like the UX community or the customer experience community or the Scrum Masters community. It can be things that are more professional or it could be things in the organization that are completely not related to the jobs that people have. So the new moms club in the organization or the Harley Davidson lovers in the organization. These things are going to create ties and loyalty, but they will also also enhance the desire to communicate and to collaborate. We are more likely to collaborate with people who have shared interests and shared values. So these communities will help us to identify and establish those relationships in the organization. And these are all inherent things in relationship centricity as well. So how leaders need to evolve together with business. If we take a look at different types of leaders for a minute, so we've got these kind of different management models that we looked at with hierarchical control, matrix management, entrepreneurial partnership, and an adaptive organization. If we think about examples of leaders from this, we've got, you know, Henry Ford II, a true authoritarian. I mean, this guy would destroy everything you can and, and had the, the kind of idea that any up and coming young star, he would clip their wings, he would say. Uh, and he lived in fear uh, because he was constantly worried to be, about being overthrown. It's kind of like being the king of the kingdom and worrying that somebody is going to murder you or take over your throne uh, and so on. So the really interesting model, but a classic authoritarian. Uh, Jack Welsh, uh, people say he was a great leader. He wasn't a leader. He was a great manager. He was a matrix manager and he knew how from classical management theory, he knew how to drive that organization. And a lot of things like from Frederick Win Winslow Taylor's <laughs> book of, of scientific management, uh, where he said the, the weakest workers need to be removed. Jack Welsh would actually fire 10% of the weakest workers every year from the organization. And that was his way of consistently improving, not investing in helping people people to be better, just firing the people who are the worst. Not, not wondering why they're bad at what they do, but just get rid of them. Let's get some new blood in here. And that's why I have a hard time calling Jack Welsh a great leader. Uh, he was a great manager, but a leader wouldn't do that. Yeah. Then you get uh, Howard Schultz, which is a, a it's, it's kind of a coaching uh, mentality. Very good with co-creation, very good with uh, delegating, allowing people to to have an entrepreneurial spirit in, in the organization. Uh, quite, quite good with all of the elements of being in a great big organization, but maintaining an informal uh, partnership type feel uh, of collaborating in, in the organization. So he's, he's a good uh, example of, a, let's say, a customer centric collaborative leader and so on. And then you get Mark Zuckerberg. And I don't often use uh, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg in positive examples, um, but Mark Zuckerberg is an interesting example of a mentor in this case, largely because Facebook grew so absolutely insanely fast that they didn't have time to implement any of the old classic management bureaucracy type theories. Uh, and they turned into a, an adaptive organization quite quickly. Um, and they had no choice. So this, this was exactly what they had to do. It wasn't by design. It just happened in that way. Um, and as a result, Mark Zuckerberg has to lead by influence and guidance and inspir inspiration and things like that. So there's no kind of formal management authority uh, in, in his style. Uh, one of the things that I like about him is if he's going to hire people that are his direct reports that are his team, 
on his level. He prefers to hide, hire people that he would work for himself. Uh, so bringing the best leaders around. And this is kind of, as I said, that laissez-faire uh, leadership style, like uh, Ronald Reagan, who, who insisted on having the absolute best team. And then he would delegate and people had delegate and people had the autonomy to do what was agreed upon. Uh, so these are these are some of the principles of an agile environment or an adaptive environment where work is distributed. Work is distributed. So now if we look at this, we're going to find these things. Uh, so boss, manager, coach, and mentor as, as the kind of uh, clues for what leadership looks like in these different evolutionary phases. So the boss is the authoritarian. The manager is the matrix manager. He knows how to manage all of those connections in the bureaucracy. Uh, the coach is the collaborative leader. The mentor is the inspirational guide. Um, so we get these models and there are things that great leaders understand with this. First, they understand that consensus doesn't work. Uh, so you've probably seen this before. This is the, the law of diffusion of innovation, but it actually works in any organization when we're looking at change and transformation. We are never going to get 100% of people that are going to adopt the new ideas. And change is a new idea, just like innovation. We're going to have 2.5% of people that are the innovators. They're helping us to detail the ideas as leaders. We're going to have 13.5% that are the early adopters. They're willing to jump on board and join the project and join the movement without having proof that it's going to be successful. Um, then we've got the early majority. These people are the ones that will help us to scale any new ideas because once they have basic proof, like some pilot project that shows that it's going to be successful, then they will jump on board. So in the last half, we have to just ignore them because they take far too much energy to try to convince and they really don't contribute well during any type of movement, change, innovation, and so on. So great leaders understand that their focus of their attention for inspiration and guidance goes into the first half of this chart, the innovators, the early adopters, and the early majority. Um, great leaders also understand that uh, old classic management theory doesn't necessarily work anymore. Uh, the Frederick Winslow Taylor principle that I will pay you more if you produce more uh, doesn't necessarily work when we're doing things that are strategic, creative, anything that engages basic cognitive skill. Uh, the, the old principles of money for productivity don't necessarily work. And the new principles of motivation uh, for, for this new environment is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. How do we have the autonomy? Think back to our gamers. Uh, gamers have the autonomy when they're playing a game. It's their environment. It's their game to win or lose. Yeah. Mastery. They're getting better with each round of the game. Each round of the game gets a little bit more difficult for them because they're learning. And again, gaming engages that learning center in our brain. Um, so and purpose. Again, in games, we've got this kind of epic meaning that we were talking about, the urgent optimism, the social fabric, the blissful productivity. We've got all of that stuff and we're missing that in the workplace. So leaders that understand the principles of motivation for this new generation in this new environment are going to understand that autonomy, mastery, and purpose are the key motivators. Um, also, we're going to understand that interpersonal relationships, team dynamic, and communities are going to drive absolutely everything. Corporate culture must be developed for trust and cooperation if we want to be successful in these new management models with the new generation. David Logan wrote a book called Tribal Leadership, which is really kind of interesting, and I strongly recommend it. Um, but he talks about internal tribes. We refer to these as internal communities. But he says something really interesting, which is great leaders can speak the language of any tribe on any level. And they're working constantly to move the tribes up to more collaborative, more productive behavior, tribal behavior. So this is a really interesting concept as well. If we're using internal communities as a vehicle for influence, this is great because most leaders understand that the way we have the org structure drawn isn't the way that things usually work. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting here is this difference between two extremes in, in leadership. In that evolution of business models, where we looked at hierarchical control, matrix management, uh, entrepreneurial partnership, and the adaptive organization, we've got two major extremes on there. One side is about inspiration and guidance. The other side is about control. So on one side, we've got principles of standard government, right? We create standards, rules, and laws. Uh, there are penalties and punishment for lack of adherence to those laws. Uh, where the mechanics of this are control and policing the environment to find the bad behavior. Uh, the purpose is to create order. The focus is stop the bad. And it, as a reward for all of this, we're going to get some stability 
some freedom from danger, a fair and just environment, hopefully, and general quality of life uh, for the people in that in that uh, environment that's being governed. Yeah. On the other side, we get environments that people choose to be in. Uh, and, and it's, it's kind of more like religion, right? Because we're, we're talking about values and meaning. Where's that epic meaning again? We're talking about behavioral role models and the, and the motivation for this is like the ultimate prize, right? We're going to go to heaven or wherever your religion takes you in, in the end. Um, the mechanics of this are guidance and support. The purpose is social engagement and inspiration. The focus is to promote the good. And, and in the end, what we get is belief in a greater purpose, harmony, and collaboration. So if we're building the environment for trust and collaboration and we want this kind of uh, blissful productivity, we need to be on this side here. So great leaders are going to have a full range of skills here. However, they will understand that in the business models on the right side of that evolution of business models, entrepreneurial partnership and adaptive organization, the skills of, of religious leaders, of inspirational guidance are going to be much better and much more effective. So as we move through this again, what we're going to see is the two management models on the left side are dying. They're, we're almost done with those. They, they just don't have much place in the world anymore. Uh, the two on the right side are where great leaders really need to be honing their skills uh, because they're less about control and more about inspiration and guidance. So for great leaders, there are a couple things that we need to do. Communicate well, collaborate well, build communities in the organization, engage and influence those communities, and basically lead. So that that's all I have for today. I've been told that my time is up. Uh, but I really enjoyed being here. So thank you very much. And please, uh, you guys can find me anywhere on, on Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, we have a YouTube channel with tons of content on it. So thank you very much.